Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Tenable. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. We've got an exciting presentation ahead, but first I want to cover just a couple of housekeeping notes with you. First of all, we are recording today's session. So as soon as that recording is available, we'll be sending it over to you via email. If you'd like to engage with us today, there are a couple of ways to do so. The first and the easiest option is to use that chat tab on the right side of your screen. So when you find that chat tab, let us know from where in the world you're joining us. I'm already seeing Chicago, Texas, Louisiana. Uh, I know we've got people from all over the world as well. Um, if you have any specific questions, we do want you to send those into our Q&A tab. We, sending your questions to that Q&A just helps us keep track and we'd like to answer as many of your questions as we can today. Um, so please direct them there. If you jump over to that handout section, you'll see a couple of resources there for you. So feel free to grab those. And before we close things out today, I will be giving away two $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around to see if you're one of our lucky winners. So today we're discussing managing security posture and entitlements in the cloud. I'm joined today by Chris Edson, Senior Security Engineer at Tenable, and Lior Zatlavi, Senior Cloud Security Architect at Tenable. So Chris and Lior, we really appreciate you joining us here on Tech Strong Learning. Lior, would you like to take it from here and, and dive us right into this? Sure, so uh, thank you for, uh, for this lovely introduction and also thanks for everyone who's joining us here on today's session. Uh, we really value your time and we hope we're going to make the most of it. Um, also, thank you, Chris, for joining for joining on this session. Um, so I'm Lior. Uh, I'm a, a, a cloud security architect for uh, Tenable. I joined Tenable very recently with the Hermetic uh, acquisition. Um, and this has a lot to do with what we're going to talk about today, because today we're going to talk about the practice of securing cloud environments and our approach as a company is tenable cloud security um, for that and the huge opportunity that we have um, with this merger and what we can do and you know our philosophy and how uh, it's implemented. Um, so Chris, I'd love for, for you to uh, also give a few words and uh, let's yeah. dive right in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for the time. Thanks for the audience. I'm excited to kind of talk through exactly what, what, what Lior had sort of given us an overview on. My name is Chris Edson. I'm one of the, I've done so many things at Tenable. So I'm, I've been at Tenable for almost nine years now uh, through tech support into uh, solution architecture, into sales engineering. The majority of my career has been primarily focused around uh, secu traditional security as well as well as cloud security. So I come from the, the tenable side of the house in terms of how the Hermetic acquisition enhances and expands all of the existing capabilities uh, that Tenable is, is, is able to provide to our customers. And so I'll be providing some insights from the field, a lot of really interesting conversations that we've been having with customers, the challenges, the pain points that they're running into specifically around managing uh, identities and entitlements in the cloud, and and with that, I think Lior, I think we get we get started here. Yeah, that's great. So I, I really think you know um, we have we're like a nice balance on the panel. Um, so yeah, so with that, let's uh, let's dive right into it. So what we're going to talk about today is we're first going to start with just the brief uh, pointers as to what is different about the cloud. I mean, what was the opportunity and the threat going into cloud security? Uh, and why is it so important? So the challenge of it um, and our approach as a CNAP solution, right? The unified approach uh, makes that much more sense when it comes specifically to the cloud. Um, what makes the identity difference? That is, why is the focus on the identity layer? Um, of course, is part of a much holistic overview of a solution for CNAP as a category, which is comprehensive, but why is this layer such important? What is the leverage that can be gained from it? And of course, we're going to see it live in a demo, right? So this is just in an overview of what we're gonna to review today. Um, and with that, I think we should get started. So in the cloud, what makes the cloud different um, are at least, at least the way I see it is two things. First of all, when we moved from on-prem to the cloud, we, we went into an arena where everything 
ba basically everything, almost anything is an API call, right? So you want to provision hardware, you want to manage network, you want to give identities, manage secrets, um, workload configurations, everything became an API call. Um, and that's a huge difference, right? Um, both, and again, both from an opportunity and a threat, which we're going to review a bit later. Um, and on top of that, not only that everything has become so ephemeral, um, now developers have access and can manage uh, their own infrastructure, right? Which when you think about it, it's great. I mean, you know, you build it, you, you run it, or you build it, you own it. Um, and it has a lot of uh, opportunity to it. But, you know, you remember that developers can now manage their, their own infrastructure and they're not necessarily, um, and I, I'm, I used to be a developer myself. I come from a very technical background. Um, so I, I know the mindset and developers don't necessarily always put security uh, at the top of their mind um, because they usually put the business, right? The business functionality, the logic, and, and that has a lot of implications um, when you have that kind of distribution of responsibility and that happens in the cloud. Um, so just to, to, just to give that point or get, get that point of view of an, of, of an outlook, um, the opportunity when it comes to those two changes is that both configurations and logs um, of everything, right, of everything, of all different layers um, that make up the infrastructure and also make up, of course, the cyber kill chain, if you will, um, are now very, very much accessible, right, both configurations and logs. And almost everything can be programmatically accessible and parsable, um, and you have involvement from more people, right? That is a huge opportunity um, when you want to gain this kind of control uh, over environments at scale. However, um, it also creates a threat. You have more hands in the cookie jar. Um, that means more people can make mistakes. That means more people have a responsibility. More people need training. More people need the right kind of mindset. Um, the environment becomes super, super, super dynamic and thus become more susceptible um, to making mistakes. And the challenge uh, becomes a lot greater. There's a huge opportunity because we have all these, all this potential control that we can have. Um, but if we don't treat it and we don't give it the right kind of attention, it can easily spin out of control. And one more thing that we always need to keep in mind, this is a very important part of our philosophy, is that you have to give a solid and smooth user experience to everything that you do. Because if you don't, it will be very, very hard to implement any kind of a security solution. You have to make sure that uh, developers have their agility. You have to make sure that uh, the velocity of deployment um, is at place. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then the solution is not going to be implemented. It's not going to be adopted and the environment eventually is not going to be not going to be secure. So just as you know, as, as, as a starter to our conversation, um, this is the both the opportunity and the threat when it comes to um, to securing the cloud. So um, with that in mind, we also need to keep a few things uh, on top of uh, our mind when we look at cloud infrastructure. Um, is that it also introduces a lot of uh, specific challenges, right? On top of on top of that uh, on top of that chain is first of all a lot of new attack vectors in the way that you manage your infrastructure and your infrastructure is maintained um, um, have, na have now become available to to attackers, and of course they uh, they have that um, very very they have their uh, uh, crosshairs specifically on that, and also what we also we need to remember about the cloud is it's still a relatively new uh, technology, right? It's been around for uh, something like know, 15 years or going on 20 years, it's still relatively new. And it's not that there's abundance of talent uh, out there or people that actually know how to deal and how to handle it um, and have the proper expertise. And also there's a huge amount of tooling, right? It's, uh, the amount of uh, offerings that you get um, not just for CNAP, right? We're going to talk about CNAP as a category, but for all sorts of tools and all sorts of abilities that you have are, are huge. And if you're a buyer, right? If you're a CISO that needs to secure, um, needs to secure a cloud environment, your head might spin as to all the different abilities that are out there and how you build uh, a strategy around it. Um, and also, again, as we mentioned, collaboration is very key. Right, it's it, it's very important to create this kind of dynamic within the organization 
Um, and politically, that, get, that gets really hard. Um, so these are all sorts of challenges that become all that more important in the cloud. Um, and what we see is we see that there are, of course, many different uh, product categories. And what happens is there's a lot of tooling, as we mentioned, that people adopt. And unfortunately, you know, the kind of approach that a lot of practitioners have is to always just get the new shiny tool uh, uh, implemented uh, and make sure that, you know, and, and, and hope that it will, in fact, get you to where you want to go. Um, they usually look at, uh, I know a lot of people look at uh, security in terms of projects, like doing a project for a specific kind of ability and implementing a sort of tool um, for that and usually siloing those kinds of abilities. Um, and that creates, and that usually creates a problem because you don't make the most of the product because it's not part of an holistic, an holistic strategy. Um, so you have all these different abilities and we, of course, today will focus on uh, an ability called cloud infrastructure entitlements management, uh, which is which focuses a lot about the management of identities and their entitlements as this very very important layer um, when it comes to the cloud. So, um, uh, yeah. just real quick, Lior, just to give you a break too. I think there's a question that was posted sort of right at the outset of this meeting. And I had I didn't answer it, but I, I noted that it was an awesome question and that we should uh, answer it live. And I think that this is a good portion to kind of take a break and address that because um, it actually leads us into the the the, the pain and the challenge um, of securing entitlements and just in general cloud security for for organizations and customers. So the question is, how do entitlements? and access control play a role in cloud security posture and what is their significance? So um, I'll give my sort of perspective on this, Lior, and then, um, you know, obviously chime in. Um, it So when you look at this slide here uh, to the sort of concept of these different point solutions, I think everybody that we talk to agrees that you need to have an elegantly integrate, integrated uh, capability in understanding um, risk, not from a configuration perspective, not just from a configuration perspective, not just from a vulnerability assessment perspective, not just from an identity perspective, but look at it all together where it can be dynamically, um, dynamically adjusting the threat or the risk that's actually being picked up. So when you look at that, you have these different capabilities, these different domains, less than 30% of organizations are actually using them to the degree that would give them the best sort of value and output. And then you look you you look at the prevalence of identity related breaches and we're going to talk about that a little bit here in just a moment. Almost all breaches are getting are trying to get access to one thing. You could have a publicly accessible EC2 instance or, or compute instance which may or may not be publicly accessible on purpose, it's a configuration issue. But it might have a vulnerability on it that's exploitable. The first thing they're going to do when they compromise that is get to the get to the identity. They're going to get to the identity and they're going to try and escalate privileges to get access to some sort of sensitive data, right? So entitlements and access control and identity are not only the connective tissue for operating anything in cloud, they should be the connective tissue for security in the cloud, right? So they're interwoven between everything that we're doing with configuration checks, vulnerability checks, activity, and many more. So I think that's how I kind of see it. But Lior, if there's an additional question on or additional answer on top of that, I'd love to hear it. So of course, I, I, I agree 100% um, with your take on this. It's, it's, it's so significant. And I think a, a way to look at it is, and of course, I didn't coin this, is that identity is really the new perimeter. Right, because again, because everything, as we mentioned before, everything is an API call, um, then everything is just one permission away from being exposed to someone. Yeah. As, as, as you mentioned, you gave a great example of, uh, for example, an EC2 that has an identity, a role that it uses, for example, uh, that has access to, uh, to data access, right? That has access to permissions of data. Just that identity um, is just one permission away and, and we're actually going to see this in the demo, one permission away from access to your entire data, potentially to, your, to all the data that you have in, for example, an AWS account. If you just make the wrong, one wrong 
uh, configuration. Um, so it's indeed the perimeter, and it's a perimeter that is very much susceptible to mistakes that can very easily happen and have huge implications. Um, however, again, as we mentioned, going back to what we talked about before, is you also have the ability to control it uh, very tightly. So I, I really like the way that you put it as, you know, why identity is so important. I think that that is that it fits perfectly with the, the thing that we talked so far. Perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, CNAP, uh, I'm not sure a lot of people know what CNAP is. Um, so CNAP is a category uh, that is, is, again, it's relatively new. It's not as commonly known as, for example, CSPM or uh, even CIM. Um, so CNAP Cloud Native Application Protection Platform it is basically the uh, set of these security uh, capabilities, right? I'm not going to go into the, the, all the detail of the Gardner definition, but the point is that you take all these different abilities, and as you mentioned, um, you integrate them together, which is something that you know very few uh, companies or very few uh, organizations have the insight to uh, combine all this information together uh, in order to uh, contextualize all their cybersecurity information from all the layers in order to know what it is that they need to prioritize. Right? That is the main idea um, behind this kind of approach, behind this unified approach that allows you to uh, really just, first of all, focus on the things that are important and also find out why they're important. And as we know, dealing, you know, remediating uh, any kind of a security issue um, is very difficult. And it's very difficult across the organization because it's uh, usually a technical issue also combined with a political issue because when you as a security professional go and you want to deal with something and remediate it, um, you usually do it for somebody else's platform. And, um, and a lot of the times what you want to remediate, what you want to apply, uh, comes in conflict with some kind of business need. Uh, and you, know, you, you really uh, need to choose specifically where you want to focus your limited energy as a security professional. And that's why this approach is so important, right? Because you have to look at the full picture. You have to integrate things from so many uh, different uh, aspects. And of course, identity as a, a, a sort of an interweaving uh, perimeter that goes across um, everything, really, um, is, is such an important part of this category. Um, so, and this really, I think, puts, the, puts it into place. So as you mentioned, um, this really is that there's a, a, a chain um, with different links when it comes to potentially having an impact. Um, so you can start with a vulnerability. Um, that vulnerability will be able to be exploited because, for example, a misconfiguration. That uh, will allow uh, an attacker to achieve access um, using an identity that is configured improperly. And that put together will eventually allow the path for the attacker to go and create that impact, right? So having the ability to look at it 360 and knowing together and fusing together all this information from all these different layers really is what allows you to do this kind of prioritization. Um, and we saw this kind of things happen in uh, several scenarios. Um, so for example, there was an incident that was reported again you know, we have access to the report. You know, so um, that's what we know how to analyze. Um, where uh, specifically in this incident, uh, I believe it was log for shell was leveraged and allowed access um, to AWS credentials that uh, resided in this, uh, um, in this uh, specific place where they were leveraged. And unfortunately, when they were leveraged, um, they uh, supplied the malicious attacker uh, with a lot of access because they were granted Amazon S3 full access. It's an IAM policy in AWS that um, allows access, unless otherwise restricted, to all uh, S3 buckets, not just for reading, but um, for basically any kind of operation. Right? And that is a, an interesting implementation of the, the chain that we saw before because um, it leverages uh, it leveraged the vulnerability, it leveraged the credentials that were uh, uh, stored in a way that allowed their harvesting, um, and also extra ex uh, um, excessive or 
uh, very privileged uh, permissions uh, that we're able to leverage. Um, and this is, of course, not just not not the only case, right? So there are many other ways. It doesn't have to be a vulnerability. For example, you can uh, you know AWS credentials can be stored in in, in various ways um, where they can be harvested from and, and leveraged, which is really really terrible. Um, I I personally think that you know managing uh, um, or avoiding the use of permanent credentials is one of the lowest of low hanging fruit that anyone can uh, go and fix. That may be a, a topic for a different conversation. Um, but the point is that you got to know where you have these combinations. You have to know where you have these paths um, in order to nip them in the butt. In order to uh, in order to know what chains you want to uh, fix. Uh, and, to, to have the most effective result. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, Lior. Um, and this is like, we keep harping on context, 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 and you don't, so like at Tenable, you know, for the past 25 years, we've been hyper-focused on the vulnerability, the vulnerability, what's the vulnerability, what's the CVE, what's the CVSS score or the impact um, of, of that technical control of a given vulnerability. But the vulnerability, the software vulnerability is only one aspect of the equation. You could have 500,000 vulnerabilities that are all CVSS scores of 10, but they're only vulnerabilities. Um, but you know, when you have, when you add in a configuration, a misconfiguration or an overly excessive permission that's giving you access to something else, that vulnerability is then graduated into an exposure that you really don't have full context of until you're looking again, elegantly integrated in all different aspects or the 360 degree view. And then the other component of this is, you know, we hear all the time when you're looking at uh, cloud security posture within the cloud. So managing configuration and inventory, um, there is just the, the, the amount of things that are being picked up and detected. There's just too many too it's overburdensome for customers. So that, so these customers become, Sort of hyper focused on customizing and tuning these different controls and policies to reduce the amount of work. If you take into account other aspects in the context, then you naturally sort of evolve this highly effective prioritization for the things that really matter most. And that's really the key. So not only are you targeting the most riskiest components or configuration, but you're also reducing the amount of workload that folks actually have to worry about fixing. Exactly. I think, I think that, you know, being overwhelmed by output that you get um, from, from sub scans uh, is, is really common. Um, like you get so many, you get so many criticals yeah. uh, and yeah. you don't know, Okay, you don't know which ones to deal. You have so many limited resources. So, you know, a lot of the times people just say, you know, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. What, what can, okay, it's all right. What, what can I do? Right. Yep. So, um, and, yep. and, and really, this is why, again, as you said, this is why providing this kind of context um, is, is so important for, it, um, for this practice. And, and again, as we mentioned, we're not going to get go back to it. Identity really is key um, in this. Um, in this aspect. Um, so when we talk about identities, and we're going to see this in the product, we really need to separate um, between two types of identities. Um, and this is something that I, you know, I see a lot of people when they approach the cloud, they don't necessarily make this kind of separation. Um, and it really is important when you develop a strategy to go and achieve um, what is called least privilege, um, because it has several dimensions to it. And Identity is really split into two. You have what is called service identities, that is identities that are meant to serve workloads mostly. Um, and you have identities that are used by people. And the reason why I need to treat these identities differently is because workloads and people uh, behave or are constructed uh, differently. So service identities. Um, are consistent, right? They're predictable. You know what it is, hopefully you know uh, what it is that they're supposed to be doing, right? Because they are implementations of code. They execute code uh, that is written, that is designed, that you you know what they, what it is that they need to do. Um, so for, for that reason, 
uh, you can aspire to really lock down the kind of permissions that they get uh, just to the bare minimum, right? Because you can right size exactly what it is that they do. And by analyzing their activity or their design activity or their actual activity, and we're going to talk about how we do it, um, you can actually right size exactly what it is that they need to do. And you can have a, a, a fair amount of confidence that you're not compromising uh, business functionality. Um, and also, if the permissions that they need change, uh, that usually happens, hopefully, uh, for many reasons, uh, that happens in a structured process, right? I mean, you don't just go, I mean, a program, hopefully, doesn't just change the way it behaves. Um, the, the, that change happens because you design new functionality, uh, you develop it, you test it, you stage it, and then you move it to production. And that process uh, is something that if you go hand in hand with changing the permission, then you can make sure that you still keep least privilege if you uh, uh, perform this kind of analysis correctly, right? And that is the huge advantage, by the way, um, that can be taken when uh, securing service identity. Now, when it comes to people, uh, they're, they're, they're different um, because they're unpredictable by design. You don't know, uh, when you have a person, you don't know exactly what it is that they're going to do um, and that's why you put a person on the payroll in order to do it, right? If you could program it, if you could script it, um, you would probably automate it and have you know a workload do do the actual work. Um, so by design, you don't know what resources they need to access, what actions they need to perform, um, and so it's very hard to achieve this uh, this uh, uh, level of uh, scrutiny of right sizing exactly what it is that they need to do. And also, which what happens a lot of times in, in many uh, infrastructures, uh, is that people request and they often get more access to more resources for, you know, for had, had hoc reasons. You know, there's a crisis now, something happens, uh, business needs uh, a, a certain developer or a certain engineer uh, to have access, to have very high level of access to an environment, to a sensitive environment. Um, so they're usually going to get it, right? Because business is king. Um, and, you know, as we all know, once you grant something, it's really, really hard uh, to take it away. So all these things put together really make the challenge of uh, securing the kind of access that people get to be a really, really tough challenge. Um, and we actually have a, a very specific approach to it that is also supported um, by, by, by the product. Um, so uh, any comments before we were actually going to dive into this? Yeah, yeah, just a quick thing, just to kind of wrap it all back around to some of the threats that you had talked about at the outset is, you know, the human identity aspect is, and I feel so bad because I come from security. I just feel like security is always trying to catch up. You know, when you, when you had sort of adoption of cloud, developers were treating it as sort of a wild west. They were spinning, you know, provisioning infrastructure and setting up applications and doing what's best for the business as fast as possible and delivering in delivering releases, but unfortunately security is like, what's going on? I need expertise in the cloud to understand the footprint and the visibility and the, the vulnerabilities and the exposures and the configuration. And, and they have to come in sort of after the fact and slow things down and, and design, uh, you know, you know, make security by design. Um, and this goes back to the too many cooks in the kitchens or too many hands in the cookie jar. And it's it's I, I feel like it's a little bit easier from a service identity perspective. The human identity takes a little bit more of a thoughtful approach to sort of solving for that. But yeah, good points. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think it also you know correlates with what we mentioned before about the lack of expertise because this yeah. is still fairly new technology. Um, not a lot. I've met a lot of great security professionals in my career uh, that were new to the club. Right. They were they were experts on security, but they knew very little about cloud platforms as they uh, started working them. And it did take them a long time, uh, you know, to get to know the ropes of uh, working with cloud environment. Uh, and that is also a huge challenge um, that, you know, that our platform is set out to uh, to solve in, in the way that it works and in the way it does analysis, um, because, again, all these identities. They, they have their vulnerabilities. Humans have their vulnerabilities. We all know them. They can be fished. They can be social engineered. Uh, they, they, they make mistakes. They can be corrupted. Uh, and of course, workloads can be, can be hacked. 
And you know, once that happens, the identity is compromised, and the identity is compromised, the entire lines are compromised, um, and things really could go wrong. And you've got to have this this control that you have a lot of potential to get, but you need the right tool for it. Um, and this is really where where our solution, where Tenable uh, Cloud Security, really fits in. And what we basically do um, is we integrate with a lot of different things. We integrate, first of all, of course, with your cloud, um, with your cloud providers, right? With your infrastructure. Um, we integrate with your identity providers. We integrate with your CICD pipeline. We have a lot of third party integrations that all work into workflows that uh, really support the kind of work that your organization does and allow you to really get full visibility into your uh, resources and into your identities and into what they can do and into all these other aspects of cloud security, fuse that information together, understand where you might see attack paths, where they can actually, where things can actually go wrong and someone can leverage several things in order to uh, achieve some kind of a security breach um, and then show you how you can remediate. Right, and prioritizing, giving you the right kind of context. And basically, I think one, one of the things that we really set out to do is really alleviate that need, as you mentioned, um, for uh, cloud security expertise. Um, because if you're a cloud, if you're a security professional, um, and you're not, let's say you're not necessarily an AWS or an Azure or a GCP uh, 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 expert, um, this really uh, you know, takes all this information, all this. Uh, I would say platform specific information and streamlines it into, into, into the panel, into the uh, Tenable Cloud Security panel in a way that is understandable for you, right? So you can, of course, still, and it's very recommended and it's very important that you uh, gain this expertise as you move along. But even on day one, you can start with, um, you can start with the panel, you can start with Tenable Cloud Security and and be the expert, even if you don't come from that expertise. You know, you can you can grow into uh, being this kind of expert very very quickly um, because it really does take all this information and simplify it. Um, now, one more thing that I really I think is really important in, in this diagram, um, and we're also going to see in the product, is that one thing that we do that I think is really really important, uh, also in the aspect of what I described before is we integrate, in our integration with CICD pipelines, we also take uh, infrastructure as code state files. Um, and we uh, allow uh, syncing of them into our platform. And we fuse the information from them with information about the resources in general, everything that we pick up from the actual environment. And we draw that connection, right? Something that we call uh, code to cloud or cloud to code. Um, we basically show you, and we'll see that in the demo, um, we show you exactly where, what is the source of the provisioning um, for, it, for resources for which we have that information, for, for which it was synced. Um, and it really does help a lot with the process of remediation. Um, so that is one thing I wanted to point out. Um, and we also have third-party integrations. We're also going to talk about that um, in the product itself. Um, so any questions about that before we move on? I'm monitoring the Q&A right now. I don't see anything coming in right now, but I think this is perfect. We're, we still have you know 25-ish minutes left. Yeah. Um, but I think this is a great time to kind of get into the console and show exactly what we've been talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but um, the OK, great. So here, um, what we have. Um, so because this is, we have a lot to show, and we're doing it in a, a short time, um, I'm not. Uh, trying to defy the demo gods so while I'm using a video. Um, so this is the Tenable Cloud Security uh, uh, dashboard. So as you can see in the dashboard, you have all this information uh, put into place, right? All right in front of you, um, already processed. And as we mentioned, Tenable uh, integrates with your uh, cloud environments. So Tenable is a SaaS solution. So it can integrate with your AWS accounts, your Azure subscriptions, your GCP projects, um, all put in one place. All the information goes um, into one place. Um, and you get to see like a nice overview of the uh, current findings um, in all different aspects. So for in, in IAM, workload protection, network, secrets, 
um, computing issues, et cetera, et cetera. And if we dive right in, what we can see is in the panel, um, first of all, something I really like is we contextualize all the information, all the findings into uh, compliance standards, um, and we can provide you a report as to how you meet them. Um, and one thing which is, again, this is my favorite part, um, is what we call toxic combinations. So we talked about the fusing of information from multiple layers, and this is really where it all uh, goes into play, because what we do is we do analysis that highlights those combinations, those paths, uh, those things that when they are put together um, can really allow an attacker to do really nasty stuff, right? So one thing that we see here, for example, is we see workloads that have critical vulnerabilities um, with high privileges, and they're also public to the internet, right? You can understand how that is, how that is problematic. Um, we also have, for example, uh, public workloads that have an unpatched oper operating system, right? We all know um, where that can go. Now, when, we're going to see that in a second, but before that, what we also see um, is a very uh, robust inventory. Right, so we, as we mentioned, we integrate with uh, the cloud infrastructure with AWS, Azure GCP, but as I mentioned, we also integrate with identity providers. Um, and you can get all the information um, from all these platforms um, in a very ordered way. You get all the resources, you can see all the connections between them, you can jump from one resource to another. Um, and as we can see, you can see all the different kinds of components um, from your infrastructure in just one place. Right, so just just getting us just getting us started. Now, um, what I think is really cool, and I mentioned this several times, is the toxic combination part. Um, and I want us to go uh, and see an example of just that. So here in the toxic combination panel, um, we can select again the public workloads with uh, critical vulnerabilities and high privileges. Sorry about that. And once we do we get just this one workload, right? Of course, in, 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 the, in the more complicated scenario, it might be more than that, but the point is that you focus on those workloads that actually uh, could be leveraged in having those multiple uh, issues with them that can be stringed together uh, into uh, making this kind of damage. So you have this workload right here. We can. Sorry about that. It's the, um, instead of the demo gods, it's the video gods. It's the video gods, that's right. They are the other gods. <laughs> um, so when you uh, go into the, uh, into the workload, um, you can actually see all the information about it. As I mentioned before, you can go into the infrastructure of the code tab and see the actual code um, with reference to the repository and the file and even the line of code where you have that specific uh, 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 object information uh, that created uh, the resource. Now, of course, as, you know, anyone did infrastructure as code um, and work with something, you know, it's kind of robust and it's kind of complicated, you know just how valuable this is when you want to actually go and remediate stuff, right? We're going to see exactly how we can uh, deal with that too. So you can see that information. You can see, for example, the vulnerabilities picked up uh, on the workload. You can go in and see more information about the vulnerabilities. Um, you can see the network configuration. You can see really, really clearly and understand exactly why it's public. And you can see the activity log, right? So you can see everything that that machine did and everything that was done on it. You can filter it based on you know, services, for example, whatever you find interesting. And here's the interesting, and here's a really cool part. You get to see, visualize, the permissions that that workload has, right? So you can see the policies that it has. Um, you can filter, for example, based on what's used because you have access to the logs. So you know what the, uh, what the workload actually did compared to what it has. Now, if, you're, if you can imagine what's coming up next is one of the findings, of course, is that the workload has uh, over privileges. Right, because as we saw, it uses just a subset of the permissions that it has, right? Because it has, as you know, a few of the examples that we mentioned before is this notorious Amazon S3 full access policy that provides access to all of the 
S3 buckets within the account, which is of course a very, very bad thing. You just want to give it access to what it actually needs. Now, what we can actually do, and this is the, I think this is the really cutting edge part, is we can go into the finding um, and in the finding, we should be able to go and fix this overprivilege. And the way we do it is by generating a least privilege policy. Now, what we're, going, what we're going to do here is we're going to show you how you can do this even without going into the actual finding. So first of all, we're I going to... I have a question just from a field perspective. I have a, from a field perspective, because I got this question earlier today, how do you know what's a least privilege policy that you can be gener that can be dynamically generated for what you're detailing here? That's that's a great question. So the way the way it works is you monitor the activity, the actual activity of the workload, um, and this is something that we do because we get access. For example, in AWS, we get access to CloudTrail logs. And what we do is we analyze these cloud trail logs. We see what is the activity that the workload actually does over a period of time. Um, and that allows us to say, okay, this workload has access, for example, as we see in this case, uh, to Amazon S3 full access, but it only really accesses this one bucket. Now, you might want to say, okay, but how do you know that it doesn't access other things? So first of all, it goes over a period of time. Um, and the second thing, which I think is the more interesting way of looking at it, is because workloads, as we mentioned before, are created in a structured way. That is, they are first, you know, hopefully, you know, not just for security reasons, they are first tested uh, and then staged and then go into production. Um, you can actually go into the testing part um, and apply uh, this ability. And this is exactly what we're seeing on screen right now is that you don't have to wait for it to find it, right? You can integrate this into your deployment process and say, okay, when I do testing of my workload, when I do testing of my software, I'm also, I'm gonna give it, for example, in the testing environment, I'm gonna give it like a, a wide set of permissions because I don't know exactly what it needs and the developer can't really uh, specify exactly what resources the workload access is and what actions it does because it's hard. I, I can tell you it's hard even for me and I've been dealing with Amazon for a very long time. It's really hard to specify exactly all the permissions that uh, are, are going to be necessary. Um, but you can say, okay, in the testing environment, we're going to give the workload a lot, right? Uh, and we're going to have it run. We're going to run all the tests, all the functionality that it needs to do. And we're going to do it over a, a decent period of time. Uh, and then we're going to go in right here. Uh, because we can do this on demand. Um, and we're going to generate, right? You see this generate button right here. We're going to generate a least privilege policy based on the actual activity that the workload did, right? And we can, of course, you know, design it in a way that the workload in the testing environment would do all the, all the actual functionality um, that it does. And we can be really confident that it, that it, it, it gets the permissions that it needs, right? So here, we can go and we can generate uh, a least privilege policy based on a period of time that we select. Um, it can be custom or it can be just the last uh, X amount of days uh, that are configured in the platform. Um, and now it's gonna generate it. Now, while it does that, uh, we're gonna go into the finding and we see how it looks within the finding. So this is the finding page. And in the finding page, we see all the information revolved that, that uh, is relevant to the finding. Um, and we see, uh, for example, um, how the role was created. Um, we see what kind of permissions the role has. Um, we see what it actually does, right? We see what it actually uses and why the, the system determined that, in fact, the permissions are uh, excessive. So we see it acts as this one bucket and we see it performs uh, these, two, uh, these two actions. And the cool part is that the least privilege policy is automatically generated and you get it out of the box with a very clear indication of what is replaced, right? This is being removed, this is being placed, and of course it will have access. I'm just gonna do it again so people will look. Um, again, the video guys are not with me. Um, so it, access, it can now access with the remediated policy. Um, it can access this one bucket and perform these actions instead of having this full access. 
Now, you can remediate straight from the Hermetic console, or um, you can generate it in an infrastructure as code and then apply it um, as a solution. Um, or, as we mentioned before, uh, you can generate it on demand and um, for your workload, um, get the exact policy here as it was generated, right? And then go and apply it um, to, uh, to your later environments. Right, so that's that's the that, that's the approach um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to workloads. Now, as we mentioned, when it comes to people, things are a bit different, right? Because you can't do that. Um, you can't uh, go to a person and say, "Okay, you did you, you did just these you accesses you access just these resources and perform just these actions uh, over the past I don't know year." So this is this is all that you're going to get. Um, with people, things are a bit different, and as we know, people can have huge uh, amount of access to very sensitive resources, and of course, they're a very vulnerable uh, part in the chain. Um, so for this reason, um, we developed a solution uh, called Just-In-Time Access. So the way we approach it is what you can do, especially for sensitive environments, but perhaps even for all environments, um, is to limit the access that people get in the dimension of time. So that is, um, you can make uh, a person have what is called a zero standing trust. That is, they don't have permissions given to them permanently, but they only have eligibility to, to ask for permissions um, when they actually need them, right? When in the very specific moment that they need them, they request that access, they get it for a few hours um, and they use it and then it's taken away, right? When it's automatically taken away, when that time span goes uh, uh, goes out. Um, so the way the solution is architected um, is we have what's called a requester and we have an improver. The requester can sign in um, using an identity provider into the cloud platform and they can request access um, via Tenable. Um, and that request goes to an improver the approver can approve the request. Uh, Tenable actually does uh, the management of the permissions with the cloud provider um, using, of course, its API. Uh, and then when the, uh, even if the permission is, of course, approved and it's granted for a duration of several hours, when that time span expires, then the permission is automatically taken away. Now, of course, this can also work, and this is a really huge advantage of this kind of approach, is that it can also integrate with third parties, such as messaging systems or email, um, to provide notification, also give this kind of seamless experience um, when you ask for this access. Um, and this is exactly what we're going to see um, in the next demo. So, right? okay. So, here, what we have is the ability, first of all, we're going to see what, it, what it's like to create what's called an eligibility. So when you apply this uh, just-in-time approach, you don't give a user actual permissions. You just provide them with an eligibility to ask for permissions um, when they need them. So the way it works is you create an eligibility, you specify uh, uh, the name of the eligibility, so it's unique and it's easily identifiable. Um, and then what you specify is who can uh, request this access, right? Who is it uh, uh, assigned to? Um, what is the role or what is the set of permissions that they're going to get um, if that eligibility is uh, uh, exercised? And who needs to approve it? Um, you can also, by the way, have levels of approval. So if, for example, you have something extremely sensitive that several people need to uh, approve, you can also do that, but we're not going to see it right now. Um, and once you create this eligibility, um, what then happens is if a user, and this is what we're going to see right now, we have here the administrator platform, the, the approver platform, and we have the requester platform. Now, the requester can go and request access um, just when they need them. So it requests a specific access to a specific account. Um, they specify a duration in hours and they give a business justification. 
um, so they can go and ask for this permission. They make the request, and then someone actually needs to approve it um, in order for the uh, access to uh, to be locked, right? So this is um, where the approver gets the request. They can either approve or deny it based on the business justification. Um, and once they do, um, then the user has the access. They can actually connect directly from uh, the platform. They get a connect button. We're going to see it right here. Um, and once they do, they can go and they access uh, the cloud account, right? They have, they have access and then it's temporary, right? Because once the duration uh, expires, then it's over. Um, now, if, for example, this access is granted um, either by mistake or um, the need, the justification for the access uh, uh, expires before time, it can actually be revoked, right? Just, uh, just when that happens. So even before the uh, uh, expected time span uh, expires. So the approver can actually go and revoke that access even in mid time. And I think the most important part of this ability is that we've developed it in a way that provides a seamless experience by, as I mentioned, integrating with uh, third parties. So for example, we integrate with messaging systems such as Slack or Teams. So you can go and make the access directly from uh, your Teams console, right? So the developer doesn't need to have another pane of glass in order to request the access. And you can do the exact same process um, from Teams. And as we will now see, the approver can also approve the request um, from Teams themselves, right? So we're now going to switch to the approver uh, platform. Um, this is still in the requester. You see the message that got. This is in the approver platform, uh, the approver Teams view. And in the Teams view, you get some message that someone wants the access. Um, they can go and approve the access um, straight again from their Teams console. They have a very similar experience. Here they see the review, what they need to review. Um, and then they go and actually approve the request. And in a very similar way, uh, the requester gets notified of the approval, right? That the approval um, actually got, right? This is again the requester. And we can see that they get notified of that happening, right? The importance of this is creating this um, very, very smooth user experience, not having both the requester and the uh, approver uh, move from uh, side to side. And finally, one thing that is really, really important in this aspect is when you have this kind of tight control over the amount of time that people have access, what you can also do is allow for uh, very, very effective auditing of such sessions. So what we saw here, for example, is we have the audit uh, uh, tab. Uh, in the JIT access. So what we can do is we can see all the acts, all the uh, different requests and all the different sessions. We can see what was approved, what was revoked. And the really cool part is that for sessions that were approved, um, we can go right here to those three dots and then view user activity. So that activity log that we saw before um, that is uh, provided for all resources and all identities and for the entire system and it's very easy to navigate it, that activity log can also be filtered into a specific session of a user um, that shows exactly what, it, what the user did during that session. So let's say that, for example, a developer was on call, they needed access to a very sensitive environment, um, and they got it, and they had access for several hours. Um, if you want to know what they did during that time, um, you can go into this panel. You can open up the user activity. You can see what they did. Um, you can do some scrutiny on it and make sure that they didn't do anything that they weren't supposed to be doing. Um, so that's, that is that ability. Yeah. Uh, so we have some questions. I think this is a good time to sort of pause and address some of these things. Yes. Um, one of the questions was, is there an audit trail of the approval process? And I had responded with, Lior is actually currently answering that right now. So uh, the answer to that is yes, there is an audit trail not only of the approval process, but of what the user is doing with those short-lived credentials 
in the cloud infrastructure, right? So keeping a, an eye on configuration changes, what they're adding, what they're removing, those types of things. The second question is, Will the just-in-time access take too much time in order to grant those that have requested permissions? So uh, along the same lines of, I think, scalability concerns is, you know, if we have hundreds of users that need access to AWS to do X, Y, uh, Z uh, for some sort of business purposes, I can think of, you know, a customer off the top of my head that has 800 plus accounts and hundreds of developers and thousands of pipelines, and it's just trying to understand like what the level of scale we validated some of these components with. So I think the interesting question is how many different people would need to approve different requests. Um, if it's one person that has like a thousand people that need to request from it approval, um, I think I think it might indicate some other problems other than the just in time access. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if for example, it's um, it's distributed, right? It's access to different accounts where in every different account you have a different uh, approver, um, then you can, I, th I think that definitely can scale. Um, and also one more thing that I think is really cool is that of course you want to have approvers, right? You want to have uh, people approve the access. Um, and again, it depends on the security policy and whatnot. But let's say that today the developer just has uh, standing permissions, right? Which is, of course, a very bad thing. What you can do using Tenable Cloud Security is you can give them an eligibility that they can approve themselves. So, and, and that would be a, a, a scale of a, a magnitude of improvement with giving them standing permissions because even if they can approve them, the, if, approve it themselves, um, they still need to go and do it. There's a trail for that being done. Yeah. You can see the session for it. You can ask them questions about it. And of course, it, it would have been a lot better if someone would approve it. Um, but um, it still is temporary, even if they approved it for themselves. Right. It's not standing, right? And that's the, that's the key is like you, you avoid the problem. I just had a customer uh, yesterday ask me about this. The many different permutations of permissions is one problem. The other is inactive identities and inactive users. So even if it is pre-approved by themselves, you avoid the whole inactive entitlements that's that are stale in the environment, right? So, and then the other side of that is, I think that part of the scalability, um, the which is, uh, the importance of the integrations, speed up the request, not only the request but also the approval and the response directly within a you know a sort of chat op scenario that they're already working out of you know, Slack or MS Teams or even email for that matter. A hundred percent. I think, by the way, one of the biggest advantages that uh, our platform has compared to other solutions or even open source solutions that do something similar um, is that is in the experience. Um, and in those integrations and in the, the chat ops, as you mentioned, um, and the reason why it's so important, and I think we referred to this before, is the experience has to be world class mm -hmm. for something like this to be adopted by an organization because people don't like, uh, and I guess that's that's where the the question really count, came from. People don't like to have their uh, functionality held up um, or have any kind of what they view as unnecessary delays, and they're and they're absolutely correct, right? The business is king; they need to have that access. Um, and you need to provide it in a way that is seamless, that will not prevent them from doing their job. Uh, and that is something that we highly value, and that is why our solution uh, is in is just in that level. Um, and this is really important for adopting this kind of solution, right? Um, so that is also a huge a huge difference. Also referring to this question. Absolutely agreed. Great points. I think that wraps us up. I mean, we we only have like thirty seconds left, so I think we timed that perfectly, yeah. Lior. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Amazing. All right. Well, <clears throat> Lior and Chris, thank you so much for taking us through um, not only like uh, all the, the overhead and the, the the technical aspects that you reviewed in the beginning, but showing us through these demos is is really what, what makes these webinars worthwhile. So thank you so much for diving into such depth um, for us today. We 
We do have one other last question, uh, if we can squeeze it in, uh, Connor. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, Lior, I'll, how is the product better than other just-in-time offerings, including the ones from the cloud service providers themselves? And they offer the context of, I love the earlier part of finding overprivileged identities and roles. Um, so again, as, as we mentioned, uh, there's the aspect of experience. Um, also, you need to remember that this is one uh, solution for uh, the different platforms. Um, so if, for example, you use a solution that is, uh, you know, only come from one specific uh, cloud service provider, then it, you know, probably won't be effective um, for, for our platforms. Um, and I, I, I think that, that those, are the those are the main advantages um when it comes to that yeah and just if i can take 15 seconds i think i 100 percent agree like if you you know cloud service providers in some cases you know they have some some uh, decent tools that handle some of these challenges um but 82 percent of organizations are going multi-cloud or have a path to multi-cloud for business resiliency purposes so you need to understand that adopting solutions and technologies to solve some of these complexities across a multi-cloud environment infrastructure is incredibly important. And then for the other sort of JIT or just-in-time access offerings, a lot of them, at least in my experience, have primarily been built around on-premise infrastructure. And it is an incredibly complex challenge to not only solve for identities and tracking access and risk across identities entitlements in multi-cloud, um, but then to also provide support for the other side of the coin, which is execute on zero trust using that expertise within the cloud. So I think that that wraps us up. But yeah, I, if you have any other questions, you know, reach out. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, also if you want to go through a POC or that's uh, that's what we're here for, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So before I, I let our audience go, a couple of things here. Um, in that handout section, there are some links and some resources there. So feel free to grab those before we close things out today. Additionally, there is a post webinar survey that will pop up as soon as we, we close out today. So stick around or, or it's also there in the chat. Um, but if you do want to hear more from Tenable, there is an option on there to select uh, more information or request a demo specifically. Um, so if, if you want to hear back from them, go ahead and indicate there and we'll, we'll spread the word. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we've been recording our session and we will be emailing it to you here shortly as soon as it's available. But you can also find it living on the Security Boulevard website at securityboulevard.com slash webinars. The two winners of our $25 AW or Amazon gift card drawing are Ranjit B and Davide C. So um, keep an eye out on your email. I'll be contacting you here shortly. If you don't see an email from myself, check your spam folder just in case it happens to be filtered out. I'd like to thank Tenable for sponsoring this program and, and bringing us all this, this vital information. Um, and to our audience, thank you so much for being here for, uh, it looks like three extra minutes, but we, we really appreciate your time and for you joining us here on Tech Strong Learning. Um, at this point, everyone can disconnect. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Cody.